All right, so we're going to continue with the lesson. And um, in this week's lesson, we're gonna talk about the initial stage of group. I'm gonna go over the learning objectives and give you a brief introduction. And then I'm gonna to talk to you about the various components of the initial stage of group and then the various roles that you have as a leader and a member. All right, so here we go. So um, one of the learning objectives is to identify and define the key characteristics of the group during the initial stage. You also are gonna gain knowledge about how to deal with conflict early in the group, uh, examine a framework for effectively uh, establishing trust among members and the group leader. We're gonna also talk about how to assist members in defining their own personal goals for group participation. In this one, you wanna ask people, okay, the topic of this group is X, Y, Z, but at the end of this group process, what are you hoping to get out of it? So it, after let's say the 12 weeks are done or the 15 weeks are done, what are you hoping to get out of this group experience? And you ask them to share their experience. You wanna make sure that it's um, smart goals, right? specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and time sensitive. So uh, make sure that you cover that with each person and shape their goals. You're gonna discuss the therapeutic factors and how they um, contribute to group effectiveness. We'll also understand some research findings related to therapeutic relationships. We'll talk about guidelines for getting the most out of the group experience. Uh, issues that face uh, co-leaders during the initial stage and how to open and close sessions. All right, so uh, by introduction, chapter six in the group uh, therapy book describes the characteristics and elements of a group process that are most pertinent when a group begins. Things like orientation exploration are the major processes that occur in the initial stage of group development. So orientation is getting people uh, familiar with what's going to happen, whether it be group structure, group process, uh, rules and responsibilities. Uh, these are all part of the orientation process and exploration, trying to figure oneself out, figure out where one fits within the larger group is also important. Now, keep an eye out for um, people who are reluctant to self-disclose. That's common. Uh, a reluctance to self-disclose or uh, a resistance might come from a hidden agenda. Now. Um, it's not always a hidden agenda, but, and I'll explain what that is in a minute, but self-disclosure is uh, important for the openness and growth process. So in the beginning, without trust, people might not self-disclose, but we talked about resistance in an earlier lesson. And, and I said resistance was when people do um, things that go against what the goals or target of the group is, right? So you want to pay attention to resistance as well. And if there is a hidden agenda, this is, what is a hidden agenda? This is something that a person may not openly acknowledge, uh, and it may not be discussed by the group members, but they may carry that into the group and can use it to disrupt the group process. So there are people who join groups and they torpedo the group process due to whatever their hidden agenda is. Um, and you can't know that until you start to see the behaviors manifesting. So it's imperative upon the leaders to shape um, productive norms, 
I encourage members to focus on themselves rather than others, reinforce the here and now focus, model uh, the behaviors that they want that are desirable, foster trust and help uh, members formulate attainable goals as we said in the learning objective, right? So what's the benefit of focusing on yourself rather than another person? The answer is simple. You're going to, um, you're going to be less likely to be competitive and you're going to be more motivated by the want or need to um, express your point of view. So rather than focusing on other people and what they're doing or not doing, when you focus on yourself, there's less uh, judgment, less antagonism and so forth. Um, we also want you to focus on the here and now. We encourage people to engage in mindfulness, which I'll talk to you about a little bit later. But mindfulness is focusing on the here and now uh, without any judgment or pretense, right? Just being in the moment. You also want to model the desirable behaviors. So uh, modeling, as we'll see, uh, refers to demonstrating that which you want. And modeling can occur by the group leader uh, or it could occur by members of the group. And when you model it, the people who are more um, apprehensive at first, they can engage in something called social referencing, which is looking at what you're doing and emulating it. You wanna foster trust. Now, if you wanna foster trust, you have to be authentic. You have to um, be empathic. And we'll talk about all of these things because this is an introduction. I'm gonna repeat myself, but uh, that's very important. Now we'll also talk about um, the research findings on establishing a, a therapeutic alliance because research suggests the stronger the relationship is between the therapist and the client, the more likely you're gonna grow. So that therapist-client relationship can become a vehicle for growth and change. Um, and then the authors of the, the book uh, present uh, guidelines for creating effective therapeutic relationship and guidelines that can be given to group members to help them get the most out of the group experience. And then we conclude the lecture by suggesting um, with suggestions for opening and closing uh, sessions, providing structure and determining the division of responsibility for the direction and outcome of the group, especially when you have co-leaders or co-facilitators. All right, so what are the characteristics of uh, the initial stage of group? Well, first and foremost, people are just getting acquainted to group pr process and group dynamics. And they're learning how a group functions. So you, if you see that there are periods of silence and awkwardness, that's okay. I wanna impress upon you that you should not talk over silence, give people space to think um, allow people to internally self-regulate if there's awkwardness. But what new group leaders do is that they feel uncomfortable with the silence. So they feel a need to fill that silence in with words. And what I have found is that when you have a person who's very introspective, they might take some time to think before they speak. Or they might speak very slowly. And if they speak very slowly and you jump in, you might actually be cutting their thought off. So sit with the silence. It's almost like that game, the first one to uh, speak uh, first, uh, they lose. So. You as a therapist don't want to lose, right? So you want to give the space for the group members to speak. Uh, and in the event that enough time has passed and you 
determine either no one's going to continue uh, to speak on this, then you, you know, you facilitate or you lead the group in either uh, a deeper question or a different direction. Now, members are evaluating the relative safety of the group. And if they deem that the group is safe, then they're going to share. But until they deem the group is safe, they're going to disclose very little. So they're trying to read you uh, as a group leader as much as you're trying to read them. And nonverbals matter, right? People communicate a lot with their nonverbals. So um, it's important to pay attention to what people are saying with their words, but also what they're saying with their body. In terms of risk taking, uh, people are not taking many risks. They're, they tend to be very superficial. Uh, you know, similar to the transition phase, or they might put their toe in the water to explore uh, if it's okay to go a, a step further. But risk taking uh, is relatively low, and there's a lot of impression management. Now, what's impression management? Impression management is where you um, try and present yourself in a favorable light. Now, presenting yourself in a favorable light in the beginning is understandable, but long term, if you do that, you're going to um, you're going to lose the authenticity of the experience. You're going to cheapen your experience, and um, that's not good for anyone. So um, that's that. All right. So be mindful of that. You also under, understand that trust versus mistrust is where it's at. They're trying to determine how safe it is. Um, so you, all of this I've said, so I'm gonna move on. So what are some fears that group members experience? So I want you to imagine your first day of high school because I'm obviously it's much larger than uh, group therapy. But think about your first day of high school and think about when you entered the lunchroom or cafeteria and there were a massive amount of people. What was your first feeling? It likely was a sense of anxiety and that, that's not a pathological anxiety, it's a healthy anxiety but people have anxiety over whether they're going to be accepted or rejected by their peers, whether they're going to fit in. So when I said that people are not taking many risks and they're doing impression management, right? So they're behaving in a way that uh, is safe, in a way that they're less likely to be rejected or alienated. Uh, we also, um, can't read minds, but one of the cognitive distortions we engage in is mind reading. And we oftentimes default to the negative. So when someone else is um, speaking, um, or if I am speaking, pardon me, I might think that you're judging me or you're thinking negatively about me or uh, that which I said was not articulate. So I, um, I might have a fear of being, um, a, creating an appearance that I'm not smart. Now, some people who engage in group therapy have experienced the group therapy process before. Those individuals are pros. Those individuals are likely to share more from the beginning. But there are many people who uh, experience group therapy and it's for the first time. And I bet many of you in this class uh, are experiencing group therapy for the first time. And um, you didn't know what to expect, right? And you don't know what to expect when it starts, but once you get into rhythm, you will feel more safe. 
So there's a lot of anxiety about not knowing what to, what to expect. And even those pros, because it's with different people, unfamiliar people, it's possible that they can have anxiety around not knowing what to expect. So other people uh, can get frustrated in group. Uh, they can have concerns about not being articulate enough or not being able to express their thoughts and feelings effectively. Uh, if that is the case, uh, it's upon you as the therapist, as the group leader, to guide them, to facilitate them. And if a person, you know, you feel like they're not hitting the mark, you could say, okay, um, can we create space for me to ask you uh, a deeper question or let's look at this at a deeper level and um, go there that way so that uh, they don't feel like they're not communicating effectively, you're guiding them. Or if they're too heady or intellectualizing, you could say, well, um, how do you feel with that thought you just shared? right? So that you can get them to give the full range of thoughts and emotions. So, but it's common. It's very common for people to not be able to, or feel like they're not able to communicate effectively. Um, if a person had experience in individual therapy or group therapy, they're going to do a little bit better at this in the beginning. So, uh, creating trust, uh, both the leader and the members have a role in this process. Um, you have to facilitate a process by sharing what the personal expectations are, modeling interpersonal honesty, demonstrating respect for people, and also showing a sense of spontaneity or flexibility, right? So, uh, modeling is demonstrating specific behaviors either as the group leader or group member in a group session to show what the appropriate behavioral style should be or what you're expecting. Now the group process, we keep using the term group process, group process, group process. The group process are activities such as establishing norms, creating group cohesion, learning to work cooperatively, solving problems together, expressing conflict openly. Um, all of these are part of the group process. But if you're going to set a goal, the number one goal you're trying to establish is trust. Without trust, without a sense of safety and security, uh, that will torpedo your group. You're not gonna get that far into the working stage if people don't trust you or one another. So, uh, but one's level of trust depends on their attitudes and investment in the group. So, what are some attitudes and actions that lead to trust? Uh, and the flip side is that if you don't do this, it's gonna to lead to mistrust in the group. So one thing is to carefully attend to what people are saying, uh, demonstrate genuine listening. Um, the worst thing you could do is ask a question, have a group member respond to that question, and then you um, restate what they said, but it wasn't what they said. Now, if that happens, if the me member feels safe with you, they will correct you. But in the beginning, it, if you mischaracterize what people are saying, they might feel that you're gonna misrepresent them, which uh, leads to mistrust. Uh, another characteristic that leads to trust is paying attention to nonverbal behavior. So, Pay attention to uh, micro expressions. So subtle smiles or the way a person looks, their gaze, whether they're looking at you, looking at the ground, whether their arms are folded or extended, whether it seems like they're daydreaming. 
whether they're twitching their leg, all of these could uh, be something that you wanna dive deeper into because they, they are communicating something from the vantage point of the member that they're not saying verbally. So pay attention to the nonverbals. Uh, you also wanna demonstrate empathy. And we talked about this when we talked about the various theories of counseling, but empathy is demonstrating the ability to understand uh, someone else's perspective, right? Putting yourself in their shoes, uh, feeling their subjective reality without losing your own identity. So um, I think there's this um, saying, walk a day in my shoes. If you demonstrate empathy, you can mentally walk in their shoes. Now, don't engage in false empathy either, but empathy, uh, you can think about what they might be going through. And for example, let's say you had a client that was having a hard time at work and they got laid off. And you as a therapist uh, are seeing this client and they wanna talk to you about how they got laid off. And you say, I know what you're going through. Well, what you're trying to convey is empathy, but it's false empathy. They could look you back in the eye and say, you know what I'm going through? As you sit here working and I'm unemployed, you don't know what I'm going through. So sometimes the most empathic statement you could say is, I can't imagine how difficult this must be for you. By saying, I can't imagine, you're joining them in their pain, but you're acknowledging the limitations to your understanding. That's empathy. Genuineness and self-disclosure is just being real, making sure that your inner experience and that which you portray externally match, being authentic, being real, saying what you mean, meaning what you say, uh, showing respect for people. Everybody has a fundamental right to respect in the group process. And no member of the group is meant to disrespect another member. The group leader is not meant to disrespect anyone else in the group. So you have a fundamental right to respect. If you demonstrate respect, people are gonna feel safe and have trust in the group. If people feel disrespected, they're going to pull away. Does that mean that you can never offer up criticism? No, no, no. There's something called caring confrontation, which is being mindful of where that person is and um, offering uh, loving criticism or criticism with compassion. Because if you cannot criticize or offer uh, a constructive feedback in a loving way, you shouldn't do it. So you wanna invite members to look at aspects of themselves that they've been avoiding, but be gentle. Be gentle with their um, feelings. Now, identifying and clarifying the goals is gonna be very, very important as well. So in the initial stage, a major task is assisting members to identify specific goals that are measurable. I keep saying SMART goals, right? So if you don't identify the proper goals, then people are gonna wander aimlessly. Now, who establishes the goals? The answer is it's a collaborative process. Now, the leaders can help you in goal setting by using contracts and homework assignments. I use both of these in my group process. So a contract can be as simple as the rules or responsibilities of group, or uh, that a person set commits to taking an active or responsible stance to an issue. So, um, and then after we decide what we wanna tackle, you sign that you're uh, you're willing to focus on these issues and you're committed to positive change. Because if you say, oh, I wanna work on 
X, but you really aren't committed to it. You're really not interested in looking at it. You might say you are, but you're not going to get the most out of the group. So a contract will um, have a series of statements of the problems you want to explore and the behaviors you're willing to change. If you're not willing to change it, then we shouldn't be looking at it. We also throughout the weeks can assign homework. Homework um, is a series of exercises or behaviors. Sometimes it's actual worksheets that look like homework from school uh, that they can either behaviorally do or reflect on and write down their experience that they can practice both inside the group and outside of the group. Now, effective therapy isn't just what happens in the group, but it's also what happens between group sessions. So by giving a, a group member homework, you have them focus on their growth all week long. So you can extend the impact of the experience between the sessions as well. So it doesn't have to be that 60 or 90 minute experience. It could be 24 seven. So um, again, the group process uh, con concepts uh, at the initial stage. So, um, it involves the, the stages groups tend to go through. So uh, what you're gonna experience is tension and conflict can build up. Some people may hold it in because they're not ready to share in the initial stage. You're gonna establish the norms and work towards group cohesion uh, and so forth, um, which we talked about. So what are group norms? Group norms are shared beliefs about the expected behavior um, that make groups function effectively. So a group norm that uh, we might all agree upon is that uh, we can't talk over one another. We have to take turns, right? So if we're going to communicate effectively, we need to be able to share the time um, and hearing a bunch of people talk at the same time comes across as white noise. Right. Now, group norms can be implicit or explicit. So implicit norms are unwritten rules, uh, unspoken norms that have an effect on your behaviors or your responses, whereas explicit norms are clearly and directly stated. So here are some group norms. So there is an expectation of promptness and regular attendance. For me, this group norm, I do it as an explicit group norm. I make it very clear that this is an expectation. Um, sometimes people understand that, you know, we're, we're going to respect each other's time so they don't need to be told this. Uh, so some, in some groups, it could be implicit. Uh, another group norm is people to make the most out of the experience are going to have to share meaningful aspects about themselves. Uh, people are going to um, have to give feedback to one another. They're gonna have to challenge one another, support one another. They're gonna have to uh, stay in the present mindset rather than in the past mindset. So I said to you that we're gonna talk a little bit about research. Uh, so here are some of the research findings about therapeutic relationships. So one, in general, the bond between the therapist and the client is a significant contributing factor to positive change in therapy. There are three key constructs that capture the essence of the therapeutic relationship. There's a group climate, group cohesion, and alliances. So the group climate uh, you can have a working group or a non-working group. A working group is a, a group that um, has coalesced and you're committed to all the commitments of group. Uh, but you can have a non-working group because of toxicity, harsh criticism, and so forth. So that group climate isn't going to work, right? So 
Uh, you aim for a, a climate that is encouraging and supportive. You want group cohesion, which is a sense of community or togetherness within the group. Um, you, you also want to attend to alliances. Uh, alliances can be tricky. Um, it's okay to lend oneself support and join a person in their experience, but you don't want members of the group to gang up against other members. So be careful with that. Um, and one thing uh, from the leader's point of view, uh, if you want to be effective, avoid aggressive confrontation. Remember how I said caring confrontation works to build trust. Well, aggressive confrontation is a leadership style that has the highest risks and you run the risk of turning your group into a non-working group. So here are some things you could do to help members get the most out of the group experience. You wanna focus on building trust. This may sound redundant, but I have to tell you, this is the key word of the day. Initial stage is all about trust, building a sense of trust. You also want to ask people to attend to any persistent feelings. So if there's a, set, a certain feeling that keeps coming up, put it into the room, say, you know, for the last few sessions, I have been feeling frustrated, okay? Tell me more about that, right? So um, then you could ex express your experience. And no one's experience is meant to be discounted. No one's experience is wrong. Your experience is your experience. So you want to encourage people to share uh, and engage in safe self-disclosure, healthy self-disclosure, enough self-disclosure that there's what to talk about in a group, but be mindful of, uh, of safety, right? So uh, people um, can overshare in the beginning and that could create problems. But appropriate self-disclosure, both from the group members and from the group leader is useful. Uh, you wanna participate fully, right? So, you, you know, I talked to you about a person daydreaming as a nonverbal expression. You might see uh, them check out and it's your job as a group leader to say, hey, I, you know, um, Dan, uh, what are you thinking right now? Tell me a little bit about what you're experiencing in this moment in group, right? So they maybe, maybe they were daydreaming, maybe they're introspecting, you don't know. But if they were daydreaming, it brings them back into the group and allows them to participate um, fully. You also want to embrace or encourage change talk. Um, Sometimes people say, I can't do this. And um, they say they can't do this in therapy. Many times uh, it's that they don't want to do it. So they say, I can't do it, but they're really saying they don't want to do it. So um, you can challenge a person and say, you know, if you feel you can't do it, I assure you, you won't do it. But if you try to do it, you might succeed. So to get people to embrace change. Make sure you engage in active listening, reflective listening. Active listening is being attentive. Uh, reflective listening is also you know, letting the person know um, how you heard it just to make sure that you got it right. Taking feedback. Feedback is bi-directional, it can come from um, the or multi-directional dare I say. It can come from another member of the group. It could come from the group leader or um, many other sources, right? So um, take in feedback and then uh, treat this as a, you know, you're going on a journey, right? So if you're going on a journey, we're gonna discover new things. Some things we're gonna be excited to discover and some things are going to be a little bit scary but we're going to discover different dimensions of ourselves and we're going to learn to embrace 
ourselves as we are, even with those scary dimensions. So here are some leader issues at the initial stage. The leaders must uh, think about um, division of responsibility, the degree of structuring, how to open a group and how to close a group. So the division of responsibility is the balance between um, who's going to take responsibility for the direction of the group um, and how you're going to um, share power with the group members as well. So th these are discussions that the group leaders should be talking about. Degree of structuring. Um, a very structured group, you have clear agendas for each week. Many psychoeducational groups are highly structured, but there are many therapy groups that are unstructured and, you know, we say, okay, well, how was last week? And then people just start talking and then people build off of one another. Now, opening a group session uh, depends where you are in, in the group process. In the initial stage, uh, your first week uh, is all about creating an icebreaker. You should open the group with an icebreaker exercise. Now, I mentioned in another um, presentation that I don't do pre-group meetings. So the icebreaker that I do to open the group for the first session is to um, talk about the rules and everybody collaboratively, I get out a whiteboard and we write all the rules that we can come up with together. We brainstorm together. That's the first one. Now, uh, at the end of that brainstorming exercise, we should have a set of rules that everyone agrees upon. I like to vote upon the rules. Each rule gets voted upon unless um, you know, it's unanimous or there's no opposition. If there's no opposition, then you just say, well, this is what we're, we're going with. I also let people know that some rules are flexible so that if we established a rule and it doesn't make sense at a later point, we can revisit the rules. Um, and that has actually happened in a group or two where um, related to food um, or drink or things like that, where people are like, you know, at first they wanted to please me and they said, no food, no drink. And then they're like, well, wait a minute, you know, I'm thirsty. Is it okay if I bring in a drink? And then the group decides to pull back a little bit. Um, that's opening a group session. Now, that's the first session. The second session should start off with a recap, a summarization of the first session and ask, does anyone have any experience that they didn't get to share from the previous week, right? And then the second week you build an exercise or dialogue around the first week in that experience. Now, closing a, a group session, uh, closing a group session can be challenging for people if you feel like you're in rhythm and you don't want to cut people off. Uh, so people sometimes struggle with closing. But closing a group, you want to summarize the core points uh, that you accomplished when you close a group. If there is a homework exercise, you want to um, administer that homework exercise or give the assignment that you want them to work on between the groups. And then you wanna open it up for any final thoughts. Does anyone have a pressing thought or feeling that they wanna share? And then people will either share or not. And that's how you close a group. Um, so those are basics. These are just fundamentals of closing a group. Everyone has their own style, but summarization, if there are any homework exercises, and then create space for people to express themselves last minute. Um, you might say um, with a little finesse, we only have about five more minutes in today's session. And because of that, we're gonna shift towards 
um, closing the group, does anyone have any thoughts that they didn't get to share that they want to share? Something of that nature. You can have your own style and come up with the words that work best for you. Um, and, and that would be how you close a group. And that is our lecture. So I'm going to stop there. And yeah, that's that.